With a flair for making money in dubious places, Robert Maxwell was a man with plenty of enemies. Was his death an accident, an illness, or was it murder? On Discovery Channel now, it's conspiracy theories on trial. From the Da Vinci Code to the death of Rudolf Hess, conspiracy theories surround us claiming to explain our complex world. Conspiracies on trial are subjecting the world's most enduring conspiracy theories to a battery of scientific tests. In this episode, we examine the theory that Robert Maxwell, the flamboyant media mogul, was assassinated by the Israeli Secret Service. At the height of his power, super tycoon Robert Maxwell owned an extraordinary empire. 400 companies that span the globe. On paper, he was worth over four billion pounds. But the truth Maxwell hid behind his bravado was that he'd run up staggering debts. 2.2 billion pounds owed to 44 different banks. By autumn 1991, his creditors were knocking at the door. Out of the blue, on October 31st, his empire on the brink of collapse, Maxwell left his sons to fight off angry bankers, flew to his yacht moored in Gibraltar, the 12 million pound Lady Ghislaine, and cruised out into the Atlantic Ocean, heading south. Was he running from his problems? Did he simply need space to think? We'll never know. Five days later, on November 5th, at five in the afternoon, his body was found naked, lying face up, bobbing in the sea. The pathologist later concluded that Maxwell had suffered a heart attack, stumbled against the aft deck rail of his boat, and tipping over it, had fallen into the sea. But there is another version of events, one involving assassination, the Israeli Secret Service Mossad, and super spies. Robert Maxwell had spent a decade or more providing information to the Israeli intelligence service and the Israeli prime minister's office. Maxwell was on first name terms with most world leaders. He knew prime ministers all across the globe. In a desperate attempt to stave off financial collapse, Robert Maxwell demanded $400 million from the Israelis. When he didn't get it, he started to try and blackmail the Israeli prime minister. He was making threats. He was threatening to reveal names and sources. This was a fatal mistake. Mossad advised the Israeli Prime Minister that Maxwell had to go. Maxwell was last seen alive at 4.30 in the morning, standing in his night clothes on the rear deck of the Lady Ghislaine, as he cruised around the island of Tenerife. At 6 a.m., dawn broke. The events of the intervening hour and a half hold the key to the mystery of his death. An hour and a half conspiracies on trial will now subject to detailed scientific examination. Body mechanics, forensics, surveillance technology and reconstruction of the night's events all will be used to solve the mystery. Did this overweight workaholic die in that most common of ways, by heart attack? Or was he assassinated by Mossad at the express orders of the Israeli government? Our investigation begins with one simple question. How did Maxwell end up in the ocean? For the authorities, the answer is clear cut. He fell from his boat. But is that the truth? Maxwell was last seen in one of his favorite spots on the boat a place he often went to urinate over the side. The sea was ten feet below. But when his body was dragged from the water, it was remarkable in one respect. There wasn't a blemish on it. Surely a man of Maxwell's size, standing six foot four and weighing in at a hefty twenty and a half stones, would have sustained bruising from such a fall. Rob is on a diving board ten feet high exactly the distance Maxwell is said to have fallen. He is Maxwell's height to the inch, his weight to the pound. If when he jumps his body sustains bruises, it will show that the official conclusion is incorrect, that Maxwell could not have fallen into the sea. It will be an immediate indication of foul play. The 
development of bruising is caused by rupture of blood vessels, which may be on the surface of the skin or in the deep tissues. If a live body hits the water with some force, then bruising will develop within a few minutes or even seconds because the blood vessels have been, been damaged. Rob's first jump has resulted in no bruising, but that could be due to the way he entered the water. If we fell feet first, then of course you make a hole in the water and that breaks the fall, so therefore not a great deal of impact. Could falling in a different manner produce a result? After three different positions, Rob's body still shows no sign of bruising. His falls have simply not generated enough force to damage the blood vessels. I think if Robert Maxwell had fallen from a height of 10 feet, he would be hitting the water at a fairly slow speed, and the force of the water would be distributed over a wide area. So although that Robert Maxwell weighed somewhere in the order, I understand, of 20-odd stone, bruising would be very, very unlikely. In fact, again, almost impossible to conceive. The lack of bruising on Maxwell's body has proved a red herring, yet nagging details still suggest that he didn't fall accidentally overboard. The body that was pulled from the sea was naked, yet when Maxwell was last seen alive, he was wearing night clothes. To lose clothes after the body has been in the water is really quite unusual. The clothes actually have become very, very adherent and actually stick to the body. Furthermore, the aft deck, adjoining his suite, like all decks on the yacht, was encircled by protective rails. Rails designed specifically to prevent people falling overboard. With a 10-inch lip at the base and just two-foot gaps between them, Maxwell could never have gone under or through the rails. Is it possible that he toppled over them? Rene is attaching motion-sensitive pads to the main joints in Rob's body, shoulders, hips and knees. These feed into a sophisticated computer program monitored by Dr. Robin Hooper that will allow him to monitor Rob's movements. Rob will attempt to topple over a rail set three feet six inches above the ground, exactly the height of the rail running around Maxwell's yacht. Key to the experiment is Rob's center of gravity, the point where his weight could be said to be focused. This is usually found to be about 55% of a person's height, but in hefty men such as Rob or Robert Maxwell, it can be slightly lower. You can see we've marked the central gravity on the front of his body around the, the waist level, and as he steps up to the rail, you can see that it comes below the rail. So what we want you to do is just to walk up to the bar. Rob will only fall over the rail when his center of gravity moves over it. The question is, what will it take to achieve this? One way of getting the centre of gravity and his body over, of course, is if he has some momentum that will pull it up and over. So the first thing we're going to do is have him stand in front of the rail and lean forwards and try and just come over uh, in that way. You can see that this, even though he comes up onto his toes to some extent with the effort, the centre of gravity doesn't get anywhere near the top of the rail, so he's not going to go over at this point. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to go over there. The human body is less flexible in other directions, so it's no surprise when Rob fails to tip himself over the bar, leaning sideways and then backwards. But Maxwell need not have been standing still. Would forward motion have added enough momentum to take him up and over the rail? What we want you to do is to walk forward, keep your speed, see if you feel like you're going to go over the bar, OK? As we watch, you can see that Although he does lean further over, it's still not enough to, to lift the mass up and over the rail. Using pressure pads in the floor, Dr. Hooper calculates that the force required to get Rob over the bar is actually ten times that produced by leaning or walking. So, some other way of giving more force for an extra lift must have been there. So either he, he jumped, or levered himself over, or that force was provided in some other way. Such force could be the result of a wave tipping the boat to one side, except that on the night Maxwell went overboard, the weather was perfect, the sea dead calm. Another possible explanation is that the heart attack Maxwell is said to have suffered somehow caused his body to lurch over the rail, 
However, Dr. Ian Calder thinks this is unlikely. When a heart attack occurs, this really means that the heart fails and therefore the blood to the brain is reduced. As a result of that, the body has a tendency to collapse so the heart doesn't have to pump as hard to get the circulation to the brain. One would consider that he was crumbling literally at the knees. He would literally fall to the ground into a heap. So it would be absolutely impossible, I would have thought, for his uh, body to fall over the rail. The evidence is cut and dried. Maxwell didn't accidentally fall into the sea while suffering a heart attack. So how did he end up in the water? One possibility is that he jumped. That, rather than watch his empire collapse around him, he had sailed to the Canaries with the intention of ending it all. Although possible, this is extremely unlikely. Family and friends have never considered suicide an option, it being too out of character for this fighter to take what he would have regarded as the easy way out. Robert Maxwell was a strong swimmer. Suicide in this manner would have been problematic. But most compellingly of all, he had a personal life insurance policy worth 20 million pounds, a policy that would have been rendered null and void in the event of his suicide. The insurers paid out every penny. So he didn't fall, he didn't jump. That leaves just one explanation, that he was assassinated. But is such a thing really possible? Murdering a man aboard a fast-moving boat, silently, undetected, leaving no trace. In part two, conspiracies on trial will reconstruct the events of Maxwell's last night and find out not only if Robert Maxwell was murdered, but how. November 5th, 1991, in the hour and a half before break of day, Robert Maxwell died. The pathologist report claimed he had suffered a heart attack and fallen off his yacht as it cruised south round Tenerife. Extensive ergonomic tests have shown that this was impossible. So how then did the body of this giant of a man end up bobbing in the ocean? Kevin Carhill believes he has pieced together the truth the result of painstaking investigations that began with a fateful meeting just 10 days after Maxwell died. An Israeli intelligence operative called Ari Ben Menash came to our office in 1991 and said that Robert Maxwell had been assassinated by Mossad. Ari Ben Menash, one-time intelligence advisor to none other than the Israeli Prime Minister himself, Yitzhak Shamir, was the prime source behind the revelation that Maxwell was spying for the Israelis. He took Carhill through the events of the night in question, describing the assassination in detail. Aware that Ben Menashe's reliability as a source was questionable, Carhill checked every fact with three other sources, one from the CIA. After a year and a half, he had pieced together what he still firmly believes to be the truth. Maxwell's boat, the Lady Gislaine, was being shadowed by another large yacht. On board the yacht was two assassins waiting the order to move. When they got the signal that Maxwell was on the back of the Lady Gislaine, they took off. When they got close enough, the two assassins slipped over the side of the dinghy, got onto the Lady Gislaine, and immediately approached Maxwell. The way the sources tell it, Maxwell heard a noise. He started to turn around. One of the assassins hit him immediately with a rubber cosh, knocked him to the deck. Both assassins jump on him, render him unconscious. The two assassins then maneuvered Maxwell's large and heavy body down the back steps of the Gislaine, onto the dinghy and across to their yacht. The sources tell me he was still alive at this point. When they got him back to their yacht, they interrogated him for most of the day. They then killed him. Then, when the sky was clear of search aircraft, they threw the body overboard. 
Now, the sources told me, and they were unanimous on this, that he was eventually killed by injecting a bubble of air from a syringe into his vein. When the bubble gets to the heart, it causes a heart attack, and it's very difficult to establish how the heart attack occurred. It sounds like something out of James Bond, but could it have happened? Certainly nothing in the post-mortem contradicts Carhill's story. A small puncture mark was found behind Maxwell's ear. There was bruising on the right-hand side of his face and head. But what about the mechanics of the operation? Could one or more assassins have approached undetected, boarded a yacht cruising at a hefty 15 knots, killed a man and left unseen, leaving not a clue behind them? A squad of ex-Special Forces personnel are about to put it to the test. According to Carhill's version of events, the assassins took Maxwell from his yacht without being spotted. The Lady Ghislaine had a crew of 13, Maxwell's lucky number. But in the hour before dawn, most would be asleep in their quarters, one deck below Maxwell's suite at the other end of the boat. However, the one man required to be up and manning the bridge, on this night, First Officer Graham Shorrocks, was also manning the radar, on the lookout for oncoming vessels to avoid collision. In the whole of his six-hour watch, he spotted no craft within five miles of the Lady Ghislaine. Glenn Rostock is manning a dinghy, currently 75 meters port of his target vessel. His radar reflector is up, as it would be under international maritime law on any small vessel traveling at night. He is clearly visible on the target vessel's radar. The question is, can he duck under the radar and maintain invisibility while approaching the target vessel? The radar being used to track the dinghy is a Furuno 1 system from the mid-80s, exactly the radar installed on the Lady Ghislaine. The antenna on top of the ship sends out electromagnetic waves. Any object in the path of these waves reflects them back. The reflected signals are picked up by the radar unit and converted into marks on a screen. It sounds simple, yet to operate it is fraught with problems. Firstly, what the unit picks up depends on the frequency of the waves being sent out. This particular radar, the Furuno radar, you have to tune them very, very carefully to get the optimum signal. If the set isn't tuned correctly, it's possible for us to just um, lose signals completely from a vessel fairly close by. Problem number one. Problem number two, although the radar can scan an area around the boat of up to 24 nautical miles in diameter, the larger the area it scans, the greater the chances of missing something altogether. To be certain of picking up a vessel, the operator would have to be constantly running through the radar ranges, searching the screen. However, the first officer on night duty had been ordered to be vigilant. His captain had given just one command as he retired to bed. Call me if any craft shows up on the radar within five miles. To approach the yacht without being detected, first of all, make sure that the people in the dinghy are kept very, very low in the dinghy. Make sure that there are no metallic objects showing, even to have maybe a cover over the engine. After a full loop around its target, the dinghy suddenly disappears from sight. The dinghy is about um, 50 meters astern of us, and as you can see from the screen, we cannot see the dinghy. The dinghy is invisible. Glenn Rostock has done more than just lie low. He has found a blind spot in the target vessel's radar. The radar is always meant for forward looking to avoid collisions. So usually, in most boats, there is always a blind spot somewhere around the rear of the vessel. You look for any obstructions around the radar scanner, whether it be a mast or part of the structure of the boat, which could create a shadow on the radar and you'd go always going to try and approach from those angles. The assassins would have had ample opportunity to study the Lady Ghislaine for blind spots. It was a familiar sight along the waterways of the rich and famous. But once they had approached undetected, 
they still faced one huge hurdle. They would have to board the yacht, something two ex-Special Forces soldiers will now attempt. Their target is cruising at a constant speed of 15 knots, the speed Lady Ghislaine was travelling on the night of Maxwell's death. They will approach from the stern, the only direction from which to avoid radar detection. When they reach the yacht, they must clamber 10 feet up onto its deck. Even for trained professionals, it's an operation fraught with problems. Firstly, it's going to be the speed of the boat, 15 knots is pretty quick. We've got such a small craft going up the side of a, a larger craft, it means we're getting caught in the wake and therefore the, uh, we can't maintain the same speed. Getting onto the boat would be a definite uh, two, possibly three-man operation. Bearing in mind all the way through, what we're trying to achieve is surprise and we're trying to keep ourselves concealed. To add to their difficulties, they've allowed themselves just 30 seconds once alongside the yacht in which to board. Any longer and the risk of compromise would be too great. The dinghy pulls alongside the target yacht and the clock begins. But they have problems. Running in the larger vessel's wake, their outboard dips out of the water, causing them to lose speed and drop back. Glenn has to steer away from the yacht's wake to regain speed and bring them back into position. In 26 and a half seconds, they are aboard the yacht and ready for action. Getting on board of a vessel this size, no problems at all. We could probably do it from every angle, with depending on the craft we approach with. The evidence is in. So what's the verdict? Although the lack of bruising on Maxwell's body turned out to be a red herring, Dr. Hooper conclusively proved that Maxwell could not have fallen over the side of his yacht. His death was no accident. Everything points against suicide, which leaves murder as the only possible explanation. The tests conducted have shown that it would have been relatively easy for a boat to duck under the Lady Ghislaine's radar and for a team of assassins to board the yacht. Maxwell could then have been subdued, removed and his dead body later dumped in the sea. Conspiracies on trial finds that the theory that Robert Maxwell was assassinated is the most plausible scenario to explain his mysterious death. On Sunday the 10th of November, five days after his body was found, watched by the world's press and saluted by the most powerful man in Israel, Robert Maxwell was buried in Jerusalem, his body interred on the Mount of Olives. It was a state funeral, the highest honor the Jewish nation could bestow. But was this accolade the celebration of one man's astonishing achievements, or was it an attempt to bury the truth forever, the final and most cynical piece of real politics?